Hello again. So today we are picking up in Habakkuk. Um, and I, Habakkuk is a really short book, but I just think it brings so many nice lessons about how we can deal with uh, situations where we feel things are unfair or, or God's timing is off from ours. Uh, so I just wanted to kind of quickly recap what we talked about in looking at Habakkuk 1. Um, and so some of the background, again, was that Habakkuk was a prophet um, during the time where um, Israel had kind of already been split. And so some people were already kind of taken into captivity. And so there's this prophecy about the Babylonians coming to um, basically take them captive. And so Habakkuk, in the first chapter, we see him kind of making this plea to God or in, in, the way I kind of read it is that he's complaining. He's like, where are you? What's happening? Why aren't you answering? But I think something that's really interesting to, to remind ourselves today um, is that sometimes, you know, we, can, we too can kind of speak out of place. Um, you have to imagine that, again, Habakkuk is his prophet, and he's already seen some of the destruction that's happened to his people, and there is prophecy that more destruction is coming. And so if you're in that situation, you would probably be fearful, panicked, you know, distressed. And so even though I joke that Habakkuk is kind of complaining, I think that we do that a lot in our time. We see things happening, you know, things are going wrong, and we're like, well, what's happening? Well, you just, you just start to panic. And the way I kind of saw it is that, you know, sometimes when you are afraid as a child or things like that, like sometimes you may talk out of turn to your parents because you're like, what's wrong with you? Why aren't you fixing this for me? Um, and we do that. So it's it's nice to see that even in the Bible, obviously, the people are still human. And so it just reminds us that we're human. And so we can sometimes do those same things. And so just again, just reminding us that there are lessons that we can pull from the scriptures to even show us how to better deal with things and, and how to kind of um, uh, deal with the situations differently through the word. Um, and so the other kind of point that I wanted, I wanted to recap from the first chapter was also just being conscious of what work have you done? Um, so again, Habakkuk was a prophet, and usually prophets are those that come and say, hey, you know, we're, we're going astray, let's turn back to God, you know, let's get right back on track, or, you know, things like that. And so when we see injustice today in our lives, sometimes our first reaction, again, is to complain and say, well, why isn't someone doing anything about it? But you also have to be mindful of maybe God put you in the position to do something about it. Um, so be mindful of that. Maybe the work is your work to do. Maybe you are the one that God has placed in a situation to have a voice, to advocate for someone, to speak up, to do something, to bring about justice. And then if it's not happening, it's because you ain't doing it. <laughs> well, all right. <laughs> And then the last point I kind of wanted to pull out from again last week was that, um, you know, uh, the good saying is that God chose violence. <laughs> Literally, he said, you know what, I'm using the Babylonians to kind of um, bring about judgment to Judah. Um, and so, again, when we think about situations that kind of happen and it looks like it's being injustice or unjust. We have to think about um, that this is going to affect everyone. And so the evil and the righteous sometimes fall under um, justice. And while that doesn't necessarily make us feel warm and fuzzy, we still have a hope. And that was the question that I left you with last week is, can you still have hope even when there's a prophecy of destruction? And fortunately for God's children, we have hope no matter what. And so in this second chapter, we're going to kind of see... Um, where we can kind of pull that hope from. Amen. Amen. So I wanted to read Habakkuk chapter 2, and it's in the message form. So it says, What's God going to say to my questions? I'm braced for the worst. I'll climb to the lookout tower and scan the horizon. I'll wait to see what God says, how he'll answer my complaint. And then God answered, Write this. Write what you see. Write it out in big block letters so that it can be read on the run. This vision message is a witness pointing to what's coming. 
It aches for the coming. It can hardly wait. And it doesn't lie. If it seems slow in coming, wait. It's on its way. It will come right on time. Look at that man, bloated by self-importance, full of himself, but soul empty. But the person in right standing before God, through loyal and steady believing, is fully alive, really alive. Note well, money deceives the arrogant, uh, and the rich don't last. They are more hungry for wealth than the grave is for cadavers. Like death, they always want more, but the more they get is dead bodies. They are cemeteries filled with dead nations, graveyards filled with corpses. Don't give people like this a second thought. Soon the whole world will be taunting them. Who do you think you are? Getting rich by stealing and extortion. How long do you think you can get away with this? Indeed, how long before your victims wake up, stand up, and make you the victim? You've plundered nation after nation. Now you'll get a taste of your own medicine. All the survivors are out to plunder you, a payback for all your murders and massacres. Who do you think you are, recklessly grabbing and looting, living it up, acting like king of the mountain, acting above it all, above trials and troubles. You've engineered the ruin of your own house. In ruining others, you've ruined yourself. You've undermined your foundations, rotted out your own soul. The bricks of your house will speak up and accuse you. The woodwork will step forward with evidence. Who do you think you are, building a town by murder, a city with crime? Don't you know that God of the angel armies makes sure nothing comes of that but ashes? Make sure the harder you work at that kind of thing, the less you are. Meanwhile, the earth fills up with awareness of God's glory as the waters cover the sea. Who do you think you are inviting your neighbors to your drunken parties, giving them too much to drink, roping them into your sexual orgies? You thought you were having the time of your life. Wrong. It's a time of disgrace. All the time you were drinking, you were drinking from the cup of God's wrath. You'll wake up holding your throbbing head, hungover, hungover from Lebanon violence, hungover from animal massacres, hung over from murder and mayhem, from multiple violations of people and place. What's the use of a carved god so skillfully carved by its sculptor? What good is a fancy cast god when, it all, when all it tells is lies? What sense does it make to be a pious god maker who makes gods that can't even talk? Who do you think you are saying to a stick of wood, wake up, or to a dumb stone, get up? Can they teach you anything about anything? There's nothing to them but surface. There's nothing on the inside. But oh, God is in his holy temple. Quiet, everyone. A holy silence. Listen. So... The things that I kind of pulled from chapter 2 is initially, so in the first verse, we see Habakkuk saying, I'm going to climb into my watchtower. I'm going to stand and see what God is saying. So he realizes he's been kind of complaining. He's been, you know, questioning. Uh, and we do that. But we see here that he's, he's getting in his watchtower. He's saying, okay, I'm, I'm going to see what God has to say. And so we need to be recognizing what is God saying in our situations. What is God doing in, in the midst of the things that we see? And we need to pray it and ask God, show us, you know, show us what it is. Show us the behind the scenes. Show us how you're moving. Um, because one thing we always want to make sure is that we are aligned with his purpose and his plan. And so we want to be on that watchtower. We want to be standing and seeing what God has to say. 
And then God answers and says, well, take this down. Write this down. This is going to be a message. We need to pass this on, um, you know, to everyone so that they can see it. It needs to be big and, and readily able to read on the run. And I, and I like that it says read on the run because, again, I think it always points to that it's something that requires action. God doesn't give us instructions. God doesn't give us a vision or a plan if he doesn't have some part for us to play in it. Amen. And so we need to be able to read the instructions on the run because we need to be running towards that action, running towards doing what God said. Amen. And then the rest of this chapter kind of really... Um, it gives kind of like a twofold piece to me, the way I see it. So it's talking about, you know, these people who are proud, the people who are greedy, the people who focus on only money, power, sex, fame, these things. And how while they may think that they are going through life, peachy keen, no problem, no one's going to check them, that God's justice is always around the corner. <laughs> that God's justice will be made plain. And, and so, you know, it tells us, you know, don't worry about these people because while they think they're building up, uh, you know, their riches and their glory, they are feeding into their own demise. They're feeding into their own ruin. They're drinking from the wrath, the cup of wrath of God. Um, so while, while we may see things, um, like I said, again, looking at the times and, and the things that may happen in our world, we may think, well, God has gone asleep. God has missed this injustice. God has, has forgotten these people. It's not that he's forgotten them. It's that it's, his justice is coming in his time. Right. And so one thing I said Habakkuk really kind of shows us is how to deal with things when they don't happen on our time. Right. Because our time is, I wanted it eight days ago. And God said, no, that's not my time. Right. And so we have to understand when we have to kind of change our uh, perception and say, OK, God's not being lax. We could say God's being merciful mm -hmm. because when we jack up, do we want him to be swift with justice? No. I don't think so. We want to we want to learn. You know, we pre we praise him for the grace and mercy that he gives us every day because of the countless mistakes we make. And so we can't ask for God to give us grace and then ask God to burn everybody else up. We have to God is just to everyone. So just how he's just to us as his children, he's also being merciful and just by giving grace and mercy to those that we think are evil or we think are unjust. Because God, God doesn't want anyone to perish. God says in his word that he wants no one to perish. So even though these people may be doing evil in, in God's sight, he still wants them to turn. He right. still is seeking them uh, and, and reaching out to them for salvation, for deliverance, for whatever, so that they can become a part of his kingdom. So even though we say, oh, well, God just must not care about these people. It's, no, he does care. He right. wants them to get it right. He's trying to not smoke them out before they get it right. Right. Yeah. So that's that's another thing that we try to sometimes have to be um, conscious of and, and ask God again, show me, show me how you are moving. Show me how you are looking at this situation so that I won't be burnt up and crispy because I feel like they're not getting justice. Right. And so then the again this, the way that they're kind of talking about these people, so like I said, you know, the justice will come and things like that. I take it as both a um, an encouragement, but then also as a warning. Because again, as we are God's children, so we have his word. We know what's right and wrong. And so this is an encouragement to us because, again, it's saying that, you know, we don't have to worry about when people do things to us, when things are going wrong. We don't have to worry that God has forgotten. God will bring justice. And so it's not our uh, battle. It's not our necessarily fight to make sure that we don't have to go around and try to police everything. Right. But at the same time, it's also a warning because if we ever get out of line, if we start to uh, focus on money, if we start to be greedy, if we start to do these things that would be outside of the will of God, then justice will also come for us. 
Yeah. And so we have to be mindful that, wow, okay, if someone does something to me, you know what, that's not my fight. But then I also need to make sure I'm not going to seek revenge on my own and I step out of line because then justice will come for me. Right. And so while I think, like I said, Habakkuk is kind of, God is kind of telling him, you know, don't worry about it. It's coming in my time. It's coming in my, in my plan, in my way then it's also still reminding us today that we don't ever want to push the envelope. Yeah. We don't ever want to say, well, I'm taking it into my hands. I'm going to, um, you know, seek my own revenge or do these things. Now, we can, al we can always fight for justice, but, but doing things out of a selfish motivation or for, uh, you know, fame or monetary, material gain, that's where we don't want to be. We don't want to be doing things with, um, with the wrong heart, with the wrong intention. So we can push forward with justice. We can pray for action. We can pray and do things that will enact God's justice in the world. But then we don't want to do it because, oh, I'm going to look good. I'm going to get on TV. Like those things should not be our goal. It should always be we want to push forward God's agenda Amen. and push forward God's kingdom and, and empower God's people in Amen. order to turn to him and to do what is right and to follow in his will. Amen. Um, and so then the very last piece that um, the last kind of pieces of Habakkuk 2 that they're talking about with the idols again also is just another kind of reminder that we need to always make sure that we have our focus on the right things. Right. We can sometimes get wrapped up in, oh, if I just had a million dollars, like I would be able to do this and this and this or I would be able to change this or I would be able to do that. And it's not in the material. It's not in the idols. The idols are empty. Um, as the scripture said, it's how can we um, tell them, wake up and save us? You know, how can we speak to the wood and say, you know, pull us out with your power? These, these things don't have power in themselves. And so we don't want to be uh, what, what the scripture says, God makers, making gods that are empty. Right, but we right. need to be focused on the God, on the one true God and the creator and how we can again align ourselves focus on him pull from his strength and his power in order to uh do the things that he's calling us to do in order to do the things that that um his kingdom stands in need of in order to do the work and and offer and sacrifice the things that um his people need so those idols we can't get wrapped up in them because they at the end of the day are always going to be empty Amen. And in the very last scripture, it says, but the Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth be silent before him. And um, what I put here in my Bible study, I said, God is the only one who reigns. The earth should be in awe of him. And so, again, just remembering that God should be our focus when we see things, when we feel like things are out of whack, going wrong, you know, things are just topsy-turvy that we always have to remember to go to Him. Yeah. Ask God, what is happening? What can I do? How can I stay in position? How can I hear better from you? How can I see more of what you are doing behind the scenes? How can I... Um, it's like I hear like asking God how can I see behind the curtain you know what is it that you're doing and how can I stay in that place and understanding and, and, and understanding you know who you are and what your plan is and what your will is so that I can be in position I want to be a part of um, what you are pushing forward so then uh, the takeaways that I kind of took from chapter 2 is that God isn't blind. Yeah. Um, he's had a plan before there was even an issue to begin with. That's good. And so nothing goes unseen. No injustice goes unseen, both from his children, his people, or the outside world. And so, again, this needs to be both a cause for joy and a call to action. We must remain faithful to his word, and we also don't have to worry about the evil that is done to us. Mm. Now, let's just make sure that we aren't the ones enacting evil because it will all be called to justice in the end. And then the last thing I had here is but the Lord. And it said, I said he is always in control. 
He has the final say. Amen. His justice is perfect, and he will, and we need to rely on him and him alone. So I hope that this just kind of helped you see again more of how we can um, we can better deal with things that are out of our timing and out of our our kind of little plans. Um, and so next week, we'll kind of see how does Habakkuk respond to this, what, what God has told him and what God has shown him, how does Habakkuk respond to this and kind of take away what how we can respond when God speaks to us. So I pray that this helps you um, and throughout your week, and we just will see you in next week. Amen. Amen.